Um, the first half of uh, of his uh, two uh, two parts of presentation is our all very own uh, our very own Amol, and uh, the title is in front of your eyes. So welcome everybody, and uh, with this I turn it over to Amol. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the introduction and uh, the invitation to speak. So um, yeah, I'll be talking about the large genius asymptotics for intersection numbers and their applications. So I guess. Um, this first talk will be mainly, uh, you know, the statements and the results and the applications. And then I guess the, the second talk will be more focused on the proofs. So for the outline, I guess I'll start by introducing these intersection numbers. So I'll start with our algebra geometric de definition and I'll pass to um, a different definition that's more combinatorial for ribbon graphs. Um, and then I'll state the form of, of the, the results for uh, their large genus asymptotics of these intersection numbers. And then um, I guess for most likely what will be the uh, approximate remainder of the talk, I'll, I'll be basically focused on applications of these asymptotic results. So um, to certain questions in, in geometric topology really. So uh, I'll be talking about, you know, Siegel Beach constants, volumes of moduli spaces and how random surfaces or certain square, square tile surfaces uh, behave. And then if I have time, I'll, I'll go to the proofs. Um, um, but if I, I don't, then I, I guess I'll, I'll talk about them uh, the next time. Okay, so uh, let me start then with these uh, intersection numbers or correlators. So as promised, I'll just begin with the algebra geometric definition, which uh, is maybe standard to many of the algebra ge geometers in the, um, the audience. Okay, so we'll fix some G, which will be a genus, some N, which will denote the number of marked points, such that two G plus N is at least three. And we'll let MGN denote the moduli space of uh, smooth genus G curves with N marked points. And we'll let um, bar MGN bar denotes um, the lean mod for compactification. So more specifically, this is um, the moduli space of, of tuples uh, C and then X1, X2 all the way up to XN, where C is a uh, stable curve of genus G and X1 through XN is a collection of non-singular points on C, which are, are the markings. You, you take a curve and you, you mark them uh, N times at N, N different points. So we'll let Li denote the uh, the line bundle and MGN var whose fiber over um, this you know this curve this marked curve is C all the way to x1 x2 all the way to xn is the cotangent um, uh, space at xi of C. So um, so in particular this Li is looking at the ith marked point at C and then it's taking the cotangent um, uh, cotangent space there. And we'll let psi i denote the, the term class corresponding to li. So for any n tuple d, um, which I'll denote by d1 all the way up to dn, we'll define this correlator, or it's also called an intersection number, tau d1, tau d2, all the way up to tau dn, which is the intersection pairing between uh, psi i raised to the di. Uh, and then I integrate that over, over the, the, the full modular space. So this is going to be non-zero only if the sum of the di is exactly equal to 3g plus n minus three. And these intersection numbers are um, rather ubiquitous in, in mathematics. So in mathematical physics, they were first introduced by Witten in, in the context of um, being defined as correlation functions for certain models of quantum gravity. I mean, they, they obviously appear as this definition suggests in algebraic ge geometry, they're, they're simply, uh, I mean, they're, they're fundamental invariants that arise in the intersection theory. And maybe most relevant for this talk is, um, uh, these intersection numbers arise in dynamics and geometric topology. They come in the context of modular space volumes and geodesic counts. So I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more of that um, later in this in this talk. So um, okay, so this is the algebra geometric definition. I'll also talk about a combinatorial equivalent definition of these intersection numbers, which will be, I guess, a little bit more relevant. Although this relevance may may manifest itself in the second talk and, and not this one. Um, in, in the context of geometric topology, once again. So, okay, so let me start by defining these notions. So a ribbon graph is, is a graph. It, it can have loops or, or self edges um, with a cyclic ordering at each vertex. So by a cyclic ordering, I mean, hopefully you can see my cursor, it's referring to, um, uh, to the fact that at each vertex, I have some number of edges to them and I simply assign some you know, I you know I, I take a loop, a clockwise or a counterclockwise loop, and then I and then I order order the vertices in this way. So once I have defined a cyclic ordering at any vertex, I can sort of double each edge at the vertex, 
and have the edges alternate between in and out in a specified way, depending on the orientation. So like I have this vertex that is that has five edges going out of it, and then I can double each edge uh, to make one. I mean, and I put them in pairs so that the one edge, whenever I do the doubling, one edge is oriented in and one edge is oriented out. And then I sort of proceed cyclically around the vertex. So it looks, um, so locally, I mean, the picture looks something like this. Okay. So, I mean, so one of the, one of the, one of the, um, I mean, one of the statements from about ribbon graphs is that they give rise to a surface with boundaries. So this sort of fattening, you could sort of view this as a way of fattening each edge and by like sort of turning it into a little ribbon. Um, do, by doing that, you, you can create a surface with boundaries. So I've, I've tried to draw an, and I've taken an example here on the right. So I have these two vertices and they're connected by three edges. So as I said, you can have loops or you can have multi edges between, between, two, between two vertices. There's an orientation defined at them. So then once you've, once you've defined this orientation, my two vertices are, uh, let me annotate. So, um, uh, wait. I'm not actually. Uh, okay, well, sorry. Okay, maybe I'm not sure if I can annotate actually. Um, uh, okay, so there's there's one vertex here and one vertex here, and they're connected by these three edges um, whose orientations are defined, whose orientations co come from the cyclic ordering, and then each ribbon you have. So you're going to have these two vertices, and these these two vertices are connected by three ribbons. And that creates a surface with the boundary. And as you can see here, there's sort of one boundary. If I follow an edge around, around, so I start at this vertex where my cursor is, and I follow it, um, it goes to this vertex, and then I follow it around, it goes, uh, wait, sorry. Okay, uh, I start at this vertex here, it goes to this vertex, it goes around, and then it goes back to this vertex. Uh, and then it goes back. So th there's only one boundary. There's only one boundary edge for the surface. Okay. Um, so okay. So we'll let RG and RG of n denote the uh, set of ribbon graphs with the following properties. So first, the graph is trivalent, meaning that each vertex is of degree three, as shown here. And we'll also um, enforce the resulting surfaces of genus G, uh, and we'll have it uh, say that it has n boundary points, n boundary components. So here. Uh, one can easily see, as I just mentioned, that this 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 ribbon uh, this ribbon graph has one boundary component, and one can also quickly verify that it's genus one. So this is a ribbon graph in R G R one one. Okay. So a metric ribbon graph is a ribbon graph um, where I assign a positive real number or a length to each edge, and we'll call this ribbon graph integral if each edge has integer length. Okay. So um, under this notation, we can define we can we can Per, uh, propose sort of a more combinatorial definition of these of these um, correlators, which is the following. So I'll fix, so uh, to define it, let's fix some G, which is again going to be a genus, N, which is now the number of uh, boundary components, and R, which is a ribbon graph with genus G and, and N boundary components. So we'll let um, NR, um, NR, B1, B2, all the way up to BN, denote the number of metric, oh, sorry, I should, I should say integral, uh, metric ribbon graphs with the following properties. So first, uh, the underlying um, ribbon graph is R, and the lengths of the n boundary components are b1, b2, all the way up to bn. Okay, so the proposition, which is, I mean, the equivalence between the, this notion I'm going to describe here and the, the previous one, I mean, this algebra geometric description is non-trivial. It was due to, um, it, it was due to Kontsevich in, in 1992. Um, so, um, I mean, the statement is that the so if I take this um, weighted sum of, I take the sum uh, over all ribbon graphs R, I weight by the inverse of the number of automorphisms R of R, and I sum this NR of B1, B12 to to BN. This is going to be a polynomial in, in the BI, and it's going to be of degree 3G plus 2N minus 6. And this top degree homogeneous part is going to be this polynomial here. So it's uh, some prefactor power of 2 times some sum. I have these intersection numbers. I'm summing over all n tuples d that whose whose total size is three g plus n minus three, the coefficient here is going to be this intersection number, and then I have some product of, some power of, of of the bi's over di's factorial. So you can actually use this as you can use this to define. I mean, if you, if you like, I mean, this might be blasphemous to the algebra uh, you know, 
people in algebraic geometry, but you can, if you want, I mean, you can just view this as just the definition of these intersection numbers. You know, you, you compute this quantity here, you find its leading degree part, and you look at the coefficient of B, B, I, like, you know, B1 to the D, 2D1, B2 to the 2D2, and then you can use that to just read off this correlator. Um, so, I mean, maybe as a, as a quick example, I'll just do this uh, sort of by hand. As you can see here, I have the, here I have this metric, I have this ribbon graph. It has, as I mentioned before, has one boundary component. And its genus is one. There are three edges here, so I have to I have to assign integer lengths to these three um, these three edges of the ribbon graph, in such a way that the length of the of the boundary component, which is twice the sum of all, I mean, which is the sum of all of them basically, is equal to b, right? I mean, that's what uh, that's what that's what this nr of of b is counting. Okay, so I mean, you're asking for the number of ways to split b into three parts. That's, I mean, that's morally around, you know, approximately b squared over two. Um, so this number here is going to be in, in you know, in leading order. This is going to be around b squared over two. This factor here is going to end up being, if I pl plug in g equals n equals one, this factor here is going to be one over two. There's only going to be one d, so I'm looking for a one tuple that sums to one. So there's only one of them. That's d one equals one. So I'm going to have the correlator tau one times b one squared over one times one half is equal to b squared over two, and that tells me that tau tau one is the, the correlator tau one is equal to one. So I mean, I think this was maybe uh, uh, sort of obvious, but it was just to convince you that this is indeed a reasonable uh, way of describing these quantities. Anyway. Okay, so uh, how, to, how to compute them. Uh, I mean, so uh, there's a, I'll give you a very incomplete list. There's a huge number of names here that I'm not listing. Um, so, I mean, the first way is by a family of recursive relations, which are um, as follows. So Witten, when he was originally looking to these numbers, he had um, observed that the initial data, one, one, um, one can define, we can compute these intersections for intersection numbers for small. I mean, for, for relatively small Ds. So, I mean, it, this, this three point genus zero guy is going to be one. Uh, sorry, it should be one over 24. And uh, this, this tau one, as I had from my previous slide, is, actually, is equal to one. And then, so th that's sort of the initial data for these recursive relations. And then, I mean, uh, the Virasoro constraints of the Witten conjecture was proven by uh, Konsevich. And this is a recursive formula, which is written here for these intersection numbers. So, I mean, this was originally conjectured by Witten in, in 1981, 1991 and proven by Konsevich in 1992. Um, they imply an explicit formula for this, uh, for the for for tau of three G minus three. I, um, this formula is a, uh, not updated. So, um, okay, uh, but, Okay, it, it's an explicit factor. Sorry, this should be edited. This 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 is actually a slightly this is actually a normalization of the of the of the correlator. But anyway, it's, there's an explicit formula for uh, an explicitly an explicit fully factored formula for um, the one point correlator. Um, and then these Virasoro constraints, you can use them to get all correlators. So different so alternative proofs of these of these um, Virasoro constraints were were produced over the years. Um, I mean. Uh, Andre, Andre had proven had found an alternative proof in 2001, Merzakani 2003, Kazarian and Lando in 2006, and there, there are a bunch of later works in this direction. And so th that's how you compute them through uh, recursive relations. You can also compute generating series for these guys uh, through a series of works. I mean, this was done in, in, in various different forms. So I just want to quickly explain how these Virasoro constraints look. Um, I won't go into, into detail on them at, at the moment. I just want to just give you a flavor for how they look like. So I have, uh, so you should view this quantity here as tau of k plus one, and then tau of d one, d two, all the way up to d n. That's what this, that's what this guy over here means. Um, so um, okay. So the first thing. So it, it, there are three terms in the sum, as I, as I hope you can see. The first one, it looks at this intersection number, and it reduces k. It reduces k and adds it to dj. So basically, you're you're um, you're combining this k plus one with one of the di. Um, the second one, it it takes the k plus one and it's it, it, it and it splits it into two more or less. So it look, you look at r all r and s. So the sum of r plus s is is um, 
Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Andre is completely right. Yeah. Um, Ponder Pandey's name should definitely should definitely be in this list. Uh, sorry for omitting that. That's that's one hundred percent true. Um, yeah. So uh, the second term basically, you take k plus one, you reduce it down to k minus one, you find all ways to split tau of k plus one into a tau of r and tau of s. And then you get this correlator. And the third is you kind of, it's, 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 it's a nonlinear term. I take all ways of splitting k minus one and k minus one into r plus s and all ways of splitting uh, one through n into two parts, i and, I and j, two distinct parts, i and j. And then I look at you know tau of r times the tau of all of the di's and i and tau s times all of the tau of dj's and j. And I, I compute that and that will give me times some prefactors, then that will give me the third term. Okay, so, okay, this is a slightly complicated recursion, but I mean, the point about it is that it always reduces the sum of the di. So over here, I have the sum of the di's plus k plus one. You can quickly see that this is 3g plus n minus two. And you can also quickly verify that in each of these intersection numbers here, the sum of the di's is at most 3g plus n minus three. So you can keep on going in this way and this will reduce um, everything down to this initial data. Okay. What? Wait, okay. Sorry. Um, hold on. I knew I was using, sorry about this. Sorry for technical difficulties. Uh, my file broke. So, uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. So sorry about that. You know, my, my file broke. Um, okay. It's back now. So okay. As I said. Okay. So here you can use these these recursive relations to actually compute these correlators. I mean, here's a big chart of them if you want. Um, but I mean, the the point is that if, if G is very large, then these correlators become very involved. Okay, so um, the, the, this, this correlator becomes quite intricate. I mean, there's not really an explicit closed form for them unless you look at very special cases. And so I, I guess the question one might ask is, I mean, do, since these things are so are, 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 are quite ubiquitous, did these correlators admit a tractable um, asymptotic behavior as G tends to infinity? Actual um, question. Yeah, uh, yeah, please. If I look at like the height of this record, is that, is that gross? Uh... Is that grows how? Is that like a the height? Oh, uh, the height probably. Uh, give me a second. So, yeah, I'm guessing it's. I'm guessing it's polynomial in the um, in the. Wait, so, I mean, so actually, you have these factorials here. So the factorial will give you something. The height of the factorial will be a polynomial. Um, yeah, I'm guessing. I'm guessing it's polynomial. Although I'd have to check this, but yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the height, I mean, I, I assume you mean some of the digits in the numerator and denominator is probably going to be polynomial in the genus. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's right. Okay, yeah. So I mean, the basic question is, do the, do the correlators admit a tractable asymptotic behavior as this G tends to infinity? And so I will state now a theorem that, um, that describes this. So um, for any D tuple D, which will be d1, d2, all the way dn. We'll define this normalized correlator. Um, so I'll take the correlator, the original correlator, which is drawn here, which is written here, and I'll multiply by this normalization factor, which is 24 to the g times g factorial times the product of double factorials over another double factorial. So the statement is that if I take my d, uh, um, I, I, I suppose it satisfies that its sum is equal to 3g plus n minus 3 as always. Then as g tends to infinity, this, this normalized correlator, the one that I've written, I mean, so sorry, the, the, um, the original correlator will tend to the inverse of the thing I'm, I'm multiplying by. So the, this double factorial over 24 to the g times g factorial times a product of double factorials. As long as my n, the number of marked points is the little, little o of root g. So I mean, equivalent way of saying this is that this normalized correlator is converging to one uniformly in d as, as, as long as n is little o, of, um, as long as n is little o of root g. Okay, so I'll, I'll get to the proof later, uh, maybe, maybe later in the series. Um, but it's going to be based in sort of probabilistically interpreting these Virasoro constraints over here. Um, 
Um, but a few comments, on, but before I do that, I wanna first make a few comments on the statement and then I wanna describe a number of applications. Uh, the first state, uh, comment is that this is sort of a universality result in the sense that if I take this product of double factorials on the bottom and I multiply by both sides, then you quickly see that the, this correlator is actually independent of the choice of, of, of the Ds. Okay, so you might view this as cheating in a certain sense. I just took the dependence, the asymptotic dependence, and I sort of removed it by hand by multiplying by the product of two di plus one factorial double factorials. But um, this is actually not an uncommon normalization in this context, so um, it, it's reasonably natural. So okay, so the first is uh, this universality statement. Uh, this this sort of statement, this sort of statement, actually, even even the prediction that the correlator should should exist in asymptotic behavior, let alone what it is, um, was. At least for some people I've, I've talked to, somewhat unexpected, and I should I should therefore give credit. It was predicted by uh, this, this this group of four authors here, um, as uh, together with the actual form of this result. Uh, it was conjectured by them, and the third is that I, I have this condition here that n the number of mark points n is little o of root g. I should say that the theorem is actually false if you if you omit that condition. So if n is growing like a constant times the square root of g then um, this intersection, I would, maybe I should say this, this normalized intersection number is actually um, uh, not necessarily equal to one anymore. So I've given you an example here. So if I have N is growing like C times the square root of G and I look at this correlator where I have a, a three G minus two and then a bunch of ones, the, the remaining I minus one of them are equal to one, then this thing will scale um, like E to the N squared over 12 G. So in particular, if N is like, C times the square root of G, then it's going to be like C squared over 12, E to the C squared over 12. So definitely not, not like one. So, um, okay, so this is a, a, a statement. I, I can pause for any questions if there are any before proceeding. Yeah, I have a question. So yeah. if I, yeah, one way to think about these numbers is, uh, is if you take like the, uh, the area ensemble, the edge of a random matrix. Yeah, right, right. I'm kind of, it's, it's some random point process. And and what these numbers are, what or rather what the what the generating function for these numbers is, is is uh, you know like compute uh, like actual correlation functions of something like Laplace transform of that process. You know, yeah. Like that. Yeah. Right? Is that uh, in that uh, in that uh, world, this uh, this particular normalization, this particular independence of the I, does it say something or? It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. Another thing that I'm not sure about is whether or not those. Um, well, no, okay, so when when you talk about the generating series, are you talking about the full generating series in those G? Yeah, the full N, generating. Or? Yeah, the full. So this, if you take that this endpoint function, so it means yeah. means you form a generating series, yeah. you fix the n, but you form the generating series over D. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's some function of n variables. Yes, Maybe call yes. them whatever, uh, whatever call them y1 to yn. Yeah. Yeah. And what that function is, is that that's just uh, that's just the expectation of a product of a bunch of Laplace transforms of yeah. the area ensemble. Yeah. And so that's a uh, so this is a, it's like saying saying something that uh, some large asymptotics that, so what's gonna happen for this large asymptotics is that you're gonna Yeah, go I, I didn't look at that. You're gonna go like in the bulk of the area process, and so this is really is it really the kind of the asymptotics that the kind of the universality that would be so familiar to like Ivan and and you? Uh, um, yeah, I, I didn't. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I did look at this at some point, and I was not able to come across an exact conclusion. But this is also earlier in my investigation. I should I should look back and see. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the answer offhand. I mean, I, I I was not I was not able to derive an exact conclusion. I mean, I was not able to derive a meaningful conclusion in terms of the area. I mean, I I, I know the generating series you're talking about. Uh -huh. I was not able to to come up with sort of a probabilistic interpretation of this of the sort of statement in terms of the area ensemble. But I'll, I'll check again and 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 see. I mean, I'm okay. Okay. Myself. Okay. Great. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Okay. I'll keep going. Then. Okay, so uh, as I said, so I'll be talking about some applications of these of these of these results in um, the next several slides. So uh, to do that, I'll um, I'll start by defining these differentials, which will sort of be the types of objects that um, 
that we'll see applications too. So a holomorphic differential is a pair X omega. So X is going to be a Riemann surface and omega is going to be a one a holomorphic one form on X. So in any local coordinate, what that means is that omega is like F of Z times D of Z for some holomorphic function F. Okay. And a quadratic differential is going to be a pair X Q where X is again a Riemann surface and Q is now a meromorphic quadratic differential on X with at most simple poles. So locally, um, Q looks like F of Z, DZ tensor DZ, where, where F is a, um, a meromorphic function with at most simple poles. So the genus, we'll call the genus of X omega or XQ to be that of X. And we'll let F, H of G denote the, the moduli space of, um, of genus G holomorphic differentials. So, I mean, um, just basically a set of all such pairs. And Q is the moduli space of genus G quadratic differentials with N poles. So um, I'll define sort of, I'll, I'll, I'll give pictures to these objects. These are rather concrete objects and I'll give pictures for, the, for, the, for them in a minute. But before doing that, let me talk about how to, how to stratify these spaces because I will, uh, I'll, be, I'll be interested in looking on not the whole space, but sort of the biggest component of them. So, um, so these spaces will decompose into strata that will prescribe the, zero, the orders of the zeros of omega or, or, or of Q. So in the holomorphic case, we'll fix some M tuple, some, some K tuple M, which is M1, M2, all the way up to MK, and we'll fix the size of M to be 2G minus two. And um, um, the, the stratum H of M denotes the set of all X omega in uh, holomorphic differential so that omega has K distinct zeros and those zeros are exactly of order M1, M2, all the MK. So this M is simply indexing how many zeros there are and what are their, what are their orders, what are their orders. And likewise in the quadratic case, we'll do something almost identical. Um, we'll fix some M, which will prescribe the sets of orders of, of the, the zeros of Q, but we'll also have an integer N that will describe how many poles there are. I mean, that, they all have to be simple. So the stratum HM of minus one to the N is denoting the set of XQ so that Q has K distinct zeros of orders prescribed by M and N distinct simple poles. So um, we'll be mainly interested in the principal stratum of these things. So these are the cases where all of the, um, the, uh, the, the zeros are simple and they're in dis distinct places. So in this case, all the M's are equal to one. So the principal stratum for in the holomorphic case will be this H of one of two G minus two. And in the quadratic case, it will be uh, H Q of uh, one. So I'll have four, four G minus four distinct zeros and um, N distinct poles. Okay, and these, the reason I'm looking at these ones in particular is that uh, they're a little bit simpler and also um, the, the biggest ones, they're open and dense uh, in, in the full moduli space. So in particular, if I, if I you know, take the full H of G and, and remove this principal stratum with the full Q of G of N and remove this principal stratum, then uh, the result will be a positive co-dimension. So uh, strictly a smaller space. So these guys definitely, I mean, in any sensible terms, these guys constitute the bulk of the moduli space, so to speak. Okay, so um, as I said, these things are, are fairly concrete objects and I want to describe them so in, in such a way. So I mean, so another way of sort of describing these objects is through what are known as flat surfaces. So one considers a finite family of polygons in, in R2 or in C, and one considers a flat surface um, X from these polygons by gluing, I mean, so parallel or anti-parallel. So anti-parallel means I can reverse orientation if I want. Uh, that will, so if I only am allowed to glue parallel sides, that will uh, put me in the, the the holomorphic land. If I'm also if I also allow myself to reverse orientation, then I'll put myself in the quadratic land. But I form a flat surface X from these polygons by gluing uh, these sides of equal lengths. So in particular, this DZ, the holomorphic, just the standard holomorphic uh, one form on 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 C, will give rise to a holomorphic differential, or this DZ tensor DZ will give um will give rise to a quadratic differential on uh, on the surface on the surface obtained by this gluing procedure. So in this way, this x omega or this x of q is is going to be a holomorphic or a quadratic differential, um, respectively. So this procedure can also be reversed in the sense that whenever I have one of these differentials, so a Riemann surfix coupled with a um, a form, I can sort of in, I can sort of reverse this procedure. I mean, I can I can I can come up I can cook up a family of polygons for which for which this this one form is simply produced by by gluing by gluing sets of sides of, of these polygons. So I mean, the basic question one might be asking is how does a typical flat surface of largeness behave? So there are sorts of two sets of ambiguity here. The first is what I mean by typical, and second is what I mean by behave. Um, I'll, I'll, this behave so typical will have a fairly uh, definite 
description. I mean, I will define a measure on the set of all possible flat surfaces. And typical just means typical with respect to that measure. Behave will have various different formulations based on, um, and I'll, I'll, give, I'll, give several, I'll give several of them in, um, in what follows. So, um, so uh, the measure will come later. Let me first describe some features that are associated with these flat surfaces. So the first is that, upon, uh, the first are certain singularities. So after I glue uh, opposite sides of, of these polygons, I might, get some, I might get some vertices whose total angle is not equal to two pi. So um, here, for example, I've taken this octagon here and I've glued opposite sides. Uh, so here's a sort of a pretty, a, pretty, a pretty picture for how you might think about gluing them. Um, all of the all of the eight vertices will um, will coalesce to one, and so the total angle at that vertex you can quickly see that it's six six pi unless I made a mistake. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's six pi. So um, and so that's in particular not equal to two pi. So this is a singularity in which you have an over angle, an angle much larger than it should be. So these correspond to uh, zero. These are these are called saddles of of the flat surface, and they correspond to zeros um, or poles of of the the. Uh, the differential. So a zero of order m corresponds to a vertex at which it has total angle two pi times m plus one, and a simple pole corresponds to a vertex whose total angle is pi. This will only happen if you sort of fold, if you, if you reverse orientation and sort of fold a full, you know, um, well, we'll see an example later on, but I mean, the simple poles will only correspond to, um, to what happens when you sort of fold um, a full angle into half an angle. So I mean, this is what happens. So this is what you get when you're allowed to reverse orientation. Um, and in any case, this octagon, as I said before, I glue it together and I get one saddle of total angle six pi. So this is going to be um, the corresponding one form has um, has a zero multiplicity two, and so we say that the surface is an H of two. So a saddle connection is going to be a geodesic on the surface that's connecting two saddles. Um, with no saddle in its interior. So it's it's this red line over here. So as you can see, this is a geodesic that will be on the surface. I didn't draw its image on the surface, but this, this is gonna be a geodesic connecting two saddles and it doesn't have any saddles in its interior. A maximal cylinder is gonna be an isometrical embedded cylinder whose, whose boundaries are, are unions of saddle connections. So again, here, I didn't draw its image in, the, in, in what it looks like on the surface. I only drew it in the octagon. Um, I've taken, uh, you know, a rectangle here, but after the gluing, it will become a cylinder since opposite sides are identified. I can't, it's maximal, it's a maximal cylinder because I can't, you know, I can't push it up or down and I can't push it to the left or to the right without passing through a saddle. Okay. So, um, okay, so I will now, okay, so one notion of what it means to, for these guys, what it means, what I'll mean by behave is how, how do these, how, I'll be interested in counting these quantities and seeing how, how, how their counts behave. So, I mean, these are natural objects that one considers in the context of dynamical systems. So one fixes, so the way this works is that one fixes a holomorphic or quadratic differential, x omega or xq, and we'll fix some, some L, which is gonna denote the length of, of um, you know, the geodesic or the geodesic or the cylinder eventually. I'll only talk about weighted cylinder counts in this, I'll only talk about cylinder counts in this talk. So I'll define n area of this L of x to denote the sum, um, over the areas of A of C, where, where I sum over all cylinder C, whose circumference is at most L, and the A of this sort of A of C is denoting the area of C. So you can interpret, see, I, what, I, what I in principle want to be doing is counting closed geodesics on, on my surface, but there are uncountably many of them, right? I mean, if I, whenever I have a closed geodesic, I, I, like, you know, I can just perturb it by a little bit and get another one. So what I instead do is I count, I fix myself a closed geodesic and I thicken it up into a cylinder. And then I count the number of such cylinders weighted by the area. So that's something like a count of closed geodesics you can view. So, um, okay. So this is this is the count. This is one of one of the counts that one could be interested in. And um, okay, so let's fix some let's fix some stratum m m one all the way up to m k, which is going to again denote the multiplicities of the zero. And we'll fix some connected component um, c, uh, which is going to be. In, in the stratum of the other holomorphic or quadratic differentials. So the statement, which is not um, quite non-trivial, is that this the certain limit exists. So this n of area, the first um, is that the n of this n of area of L of x, it scales like L squared. And the second is that after I divide out by L squared, then it will converge to a limit. And this limit is actually independent of the choice of, of x 
um, of x omega or x q. So it's independent of the choice of quadratic differential. I mean, in 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 your in your connected component C. So this limit here, I can now I can now talk about it. It's called an area Siegel Beach constant. So what we might be interested in is how what is this number, right? It's a number. It counts. It counts. You know, it counts cylinders on on my surface. How does it behave? So in the in the case of holomorphic differentials, this is fairly well understood um, uh, for all strata. Um, so in this case, one actually has a somewhat surprising universality result that the C of area, this I mean, this area single beach constant, it converges to one half um, for any stratum M as long as the genus tends to infinity. So I, I just, this is a, a universality result. Um, the fact that this should be true, I mean, the fact that this should not depend on M is, is, is somewhat not, is quite not obvious. And I, even now, I don't know of a heuristic interpretation as to why this should be true other than the fact that one can prove it. And it was originally predicted by Eskin and Zorich in, in 2015. Uh, okay, so now for the quadratic case, when I allow myself poles and I allow myself to glue anti-parallel sides on my polygons, I, um, one can um, compute these asymptotics only in the case of the, the bulkiest stratum, right, the principal one. And uh, the statement there is that as G tends to infinity, and as long as my n is fixed, so I can fix it to be anything like 10 or 5 or whatever, but as I, I fix n in the g10 to infinity, and the statement is that this area Siegel Beach constant uh, converges to a quarter. Um, and the conjecture is actually, once again, that this thing should, should, should not depend on the stratum. It should be one quarter regardless of the stratum, but this only remains proven uh, in, in the case of the principal one. So I can, I can pause again and ask if there are any uh, questions before continuing. Uh, no. Okay, so I can I can keep going then. Um, okay, so now I should define the measure. So as I said, I want to understand how a tip. I know often been using the word typical, um, a typical flat surface or a typical uh, differential. I should now define what I mean by by the word typical. And to do that, one has to define a measure, which is called the maser beach measure, or the Lebeg measure on the space of all of these differentials. So, um, so, okay, so one fixes a stratum M, which is M one of two, which M1, M2 all down to MK with total size 2G minus two. I'll only, be, I'll only talk about this in detail in the case of, of the holomorphic case. The, the quadratic case is, is fairly similar. So we'll denote it saddles by Z1, Z2 all the way up to ZK. And we'll set, set, set N equal to 2G plus K minus one. So we'll let gamma one, gamma two, all the way up to gamma N denote um, a basis for this relative homology group. So I take X and I, I look at these Z, I, I, you know, I, I look at the relative homology group with, with, with respect to these K saddles. Um, so I can, yeah, right. So I let this gamma one, gamma two, all the way up to gamma N denote a basis for this relative homology group. So one can view them as sort of loops, um, loops on, on the flat surface itself. Um, or so this gamma one, gamma two, all the way up to gamma two T will denote a basis for simply X, uh, for, for the for, for for x itself, and then for each i, one can let gamma of two g plus i denote a curve connecting z i to z i plus one. Okay, so this is called sometimes called a period basis, and I mean again geometrically, one can interpret this as as the sides of the polygons that that are glued to form x. So this, these gammas are are just simply parameterizing the sides of polygons that one glues to form this to form the surface x. So the period. Okay, so one one defines. Um, Next, the period map, which is basically just um, coordinatizing these sides. So one takes your one form and integrates along gamma j, and one gets a, a number. Um, and one does this for each j between 1 and n. So this is a period map phi. We'll call the period, period map applied to x omega, just this n tuple of integrals. So again, these integrals, each individual integral can be viewed as sort of the side length maybe the, uh, the side lengths of the polygons that are, that are being glued to form X. So, um, and the maser V measure is simply just the, the, the Lebesgue measure on this set of side lengths. So it's the pullback of the Lebesgue measure on, on CN. And one can see that this is actually independent of the basis of gamma one, gamma two, all of the gamma M. So, I mean, it's maybe, maybe in most informal terms, this maser V uh, measure is simply the Lebesgue measure on all of the side lengths of the polygons that one glues to form the surface X. Okay, so as stated, um, this maser beach measure. The, the, I mean, if I if I if I compute the volume, of, if I try to compute the volume of H of the full stratum H of n, it will be infinite. And the reason is that I can always scale the differential. If I have some x omega, that's that's some differential. Then I can also 
take the differential and multiply it by any constant c, and that will also be differential. So the way in which one sort of circumvents this issue is by by fixing the area of the um, of the um, of, of the surface. So we'll let h sub one of m denote the set of all x omega with area one. So in practical terms, what that means is that if I take i over two times the wedge of omega omega bar, that's equal to one. There's nothing really sinister going on with this wedge of omega omega bar. If I view omega as x plus i dy, omega omega bar is um, you know it's it's something like minus two d two i dx dy. So this i over two just cancels that out. You get something that looks like um, dx dy. Anyway, so um, now this Mazur Beach measure um, induces a measure, which I'll denote by mu one, a uh, new one on this subset of area one differentials. And we'll set the volume of H to note to denote the, the volume of this um, area of this area one subset. And now, okay, so now the statement is that this volume is finite. And one can do something very similar in the context of quadratic differentials. Uh, just as a technicality, we'll normalize the area there to be a half instead of equal to one. And this proceeds by passing to a double cover of XQ. I won't go into that. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's rather similar. Um, so, um, so this is this is how one defines this, the these the volumes of these um, of these um, of these modular spaces. So the principal stratum, uh, as I mentioned before, it has it has positive co-dimension in H of G or in Q G of N. So it makes sense for me then to just call the volume of the full modular space simply the volume of the principal stratum, the 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 one that the one that constitutes basically the bulk of it. So I'll call the volume of H of G equal to the volume of H of one, two G minus two and the volume of Q G of N to be the volume of uh, this principal stratum once again. Okay, so one can then, um, so I, I've introduced these, these measures now. So this allows me to do two things. First of all, I can, talk, I can talk about probability on these spaces. Right now that I have a measure, I can, um, I can talk, I, I, I can look at how random surfaces look like. And second of all, it actually does something somewhat unexpected, which is that these area Siegel Beach constants that I had described before that enumerate these, you know, these cylinders, for example, they're actually given by explicit poly, explicit Laurent polynomials. I can, I can, I can write them explicitly in terms of these volumes. There are exact formulas that express the C area in terms of these volumes. So in principle, if I have these volumes that, that allows me to evaluate the C area, I mean, uh, it's somewhat, it gets somewhat complicated though, because these, these, um, these, these, these Siegel Beach constants actually, I mean, the, the polynomials involved or these Laurent polynomials involved actually involve sort of an exponential in many terms. So it gets somewhat complicated to analyze the, their limit. But um, what often happens is that the sums are dominated by one or, or a few terms. So this is all in the context of, of quadratic of holomorphic differentials. There's a similar story in the case of quadratic differentials. And I'll just state I'll just state sort of an explicit an explicit formula. Uh, so if I let this vg of n denote the volume of qg of n after normalizing by a certain constant, then this this area Siegel Beach constant is equal to. Okay, you can see it here. It's 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 something. It's actually not so. It it, um, it looks a little bit like the Virasoro constraint actually. Um, it's it's some Laurent. I mean, it's it's some rational function in these vgs basically. So here, I mean, the sum is simplest since it only involves e g term uh, about g terms, which are which in the sum of g terms is, is here. But in the large genus limit, it actually so happens that the the um, at almost all of these terms are negligible except the red term. So I mean, the c area constant is dominated by this red term. So basically, once one has these volumes, one could quickly read off the the, the area Siegel Beach constant, at least in this case. So so how do the so it's, yeah question yeah is that the uh... The, the, the fact that some sum is dominated by one, one term can it be upgraded to a statement that you know what we're actually counting like the actual uh, things we count there they have a certain specific shape i will get to that i will get to that oh. i will yeah i will get to that yeah it's, it's a good question it's, it's it's rather interesting one yeah i'll, I'll try to get there uh, but it'll be a little, a little bit later on um so. um Okay, so okay, so so that, that more or less reduces the question to these volume asymptotics. So, um, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, yeah, so yeah, that that basically reduces the question of these the Siegel Beach constants to the volume asymptotics. So again, how this is going to work? I started with this asymptotics for these intersection numbers. I kind of switched gears to these asymptotics of these these counting functions, these Siegel Beach constants. I'm describing how those. I, I just described how those. I, I all right. I mentioned how those are written in terms of volumes. And what will happen is that those volumes are in turn written in terms of the intersection number. So at the end, this will this will be a somewhat maybe contrived way of saying that this 
the second part is is in as is in a certain sense an application of these volume uh, of these intersection number asymptotics. So okay, so um, okay, so how do these volume asymptotics behave? Again, in the holomorphic case, this is fairly well understood. Uh, there's an explicit um, there's an explicit asymptotic formula for how these volumes behave. Uh, it, it's written over here um, for any stratum. Um, its original proof was combinatorial, and then its second proof was based on sort of intersection theory. Uh, an extension one an extension on this result is that if one lets one can also consider um, the, an all order asymptotic expansion. So as I said, as G tends to infinity, this volume tends to this sort of explicit quantity. But one can also ask for the correction. Like, well, if I if I if I divide both sides by this quantity by, by this side here, it tends to one. I mean, what, one plus what? So one can so it turns out this is going to have some expansion in G inverse. It's going to be like one plus C over G plus C prime over G squared, and one can compute those C those Cs and C primes, etc. So I mean, both the asymptotics and their basically their full corrections are understood in full detail in the holomorphic case. So in the quadratic case, uh, these asymptotics are only known once again for the, for the biggest guy for the for the principal stratum. And the statement is that as G tends to infinity, one has the, the volume of this moduli space of quadratic differentials is given by four over pi times eight thirds to this, you know, this exponent here, four G plus n minus four times two to the n. And if I plug this in back here. And I sort of just assume, I mean, it's, it's not hard to prove uh, that this red term contains all of the um, all of the mass. Then you'll quickly read off the uh, this theorem here, the fact that the area of sequel of each constant is a, is a quarter. It tends to a quarter. So I mean, really, uh, the area of sequel of each constant asymptotics almost directly follow from this, this, this theorem and this formula back here. Um, uh, there are a few, I mean, I'll, I'll just quickly mention that there are a few other predictions and open questions in, in this context. One is an all order asymptotic expansion. Again, one can divide both sides by the limiting value and try to see what, what the corrections are. Uh, there are some conjectures here by Yang, Zegye, and, and Zhang. And also, there are also conjectures for the volumes on uh, arbitrary strata. I, I won't go in, into that though. Uh, okay, so, um, okay, so now I've I've, I've described these volume asymptotics. And next, what I want to do is, um, is go, into, um, uh, go into how these things are related to, to intersection numbers. And in so doing, we'll sort of index, I mean, so th this volume will be a sum of, of many terms. And these many terms will themselves admit geometric interpretations. Those many terms will be sort of supported on just a few. And this is going to go sort of back to Andre's question about, about, about saying that, saying something about the structure of how the random surface looks by the fact that these sums are supported on so few terms. Um, but I need to set things up a little bit uh, in order to get there. Um, so I'll first give the formula and then I'll sort of interpret it geometrically. Um, okay, so to do that, let me define what a stable graph is. Again, this is some, somewhat standard from the perspective of algebra, algebraic geometry. Um, so um, eventually what will happen is that this volume will be expressed through a polynomial of correlators. And this polynomial of a, of a sum of the set of all stable graphs. So I should tell you what a stable graph is. So it's a connected graph. So a stable graph of genus G is a connected graph with the following properties. So each vertex attached to each vertex V is some number of half edges, okay? So half an edge is exactly what you, I mean, is exactly what, you, what it sounds like. It's, it's like, I, it's, 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 you should view it as half of an edge. So, I mean, so two half edges, either coming from the same vertex or from different vertices can be joined together to form an edge. And um, I can have some number n of half edges that are unpaired. So edges, half edges can be paired to form an edge or they can be unpaired. So they're sort of left, left hanging, so to speak. So each vertex V is also labeled by a non-negative integer G, v, G of V. And uh, this G of V satisfies a genus condition telling you what the sum of the the G's is. So the sum of the GVs is equal to the genus of the graph. I mean, so minus the number of edges plus the number of vertices minus one. And this is also the stability condition, which tells me that two G of V plus N of V is at least three. I mean, so these maybe are, are somewhat arbitrary um, um, combinatorial conditions. They probably, I mean, maybe maybe from the, um, there may be a little bit more natural from, uh, from the perspective of these, um, the moduli space of stable curves. So these genus G graphs, these genus G stable graphs are associated with stable curves on the boundary of MG of N. So the vertices correspond to irreducible, irreducible components of any, of any stable curve. The half edges correspond to either marked points or nodes of the curve where an un, 
unpaired half edge is a mark point, and the, the paired half edge is a, and the paired half edge, which is really an edge, is a node. And the label, this G of V, corresponds to the genus of the of, the, of this irreducible component associated with, with V. And the genus condition is telling me that the genus of the whole surface of the whole of the whole curve is equal to G. And the stability condition is, is the stability of, I mean, this um, the stability of the uh, of the uh, you know of the degeneration. It's the, the stability of the stable curve, meaning that it has at least three singularities. To, um, and so we'll let G, big G of little b G denote the number, the set of stable graphs of genus G. So, okay, so I will now describe, okay, so the first thing I'll do is I'll describe a formula for this volume in terms of these stable graphs. It's gonna occupy the next two slides. Then I will geometrically interpret this formula. And then I'll say, say how you can read off statistics from this formula based on the asymptotics of each individual sum and. Okay, so that's how it's gonna go for, um, for, the, next, for the next few slides. Um, uh, okay, so um, so I'll fix some integers g again, which is a genus, and n, which is um, uh, yeah, n, which is more or less going to be the number of um, it's the same n as I had as I had before. So um, so so remember this polynomial n g of n g of n of b. So this was the Konsevich polynomial that I had, you know, on, on maybe my, one of my first five slides. So it's the top degree polynomial in the enumeration of these trivalent ribbon graphs. So uh, it's this, you know, this pre, this power of two times this correlator times this polynomial in the b's. So I'll fix some gamma in my that's that's going to be a, sta a stable stable graph. And for each edge in the stable graph, I'll let b of e denote a variable. So associated with each vari with each edge in the stable graph is a variable, and associated with each vertex is a collection of of um, of, of variables. Okay, so I've I've, just, I've described here like sort of you can read it if you want. I've described here what this variable set is exactly, uh, but I mean it's it's more of the structure of the formula that I'm interested in for now at least, and not not the formula itself, and not the details itself. So I have some set of vertices associated with each. Um, Set of, set of variables associated with each vertex. And I'll define this polynomial to be, I have some explicit fact, so some polynomial that's going to depend on gamma. It's gonna be a polynomial in these, in these Bs and it's some prefactor times a monomial involving the product of these Bs times a product of these Konsevich polynomials associated where the product is over all vertices of the graph. Okay, so here is just some polynomial that I'm, I'm somewhat arbitrarily, at least for the moment, writing down. Uh, I've recalled it over here. And I'll define a linear map, which basically on, on the set of all polynomials in these variables, in these B variables, that um, that takes a monomial, you know, B, the product of B, uh, Bs to the B, I, J to the R, J, and sets it equal to R, J factorial times the zeta function in R, J plus one. Okay, so this is, again, this is just a definition. And the statement is that the volume of the, the, the the volume of this moduli space of quadratic differentials is equal to the sum over all stable graphs in um, of genus G of this Z applied to this polynomial P. Okay, so this is giving me a somewhat, I'm just giving me an explicit formula for this, this volume. And okay, I, I've, I've fixed N to be zero here. I can also allow myself simple poles by setting N equal to N, N bigger than zero and a rather similar statement holds. I, I, won't, I, won't, I, won't, I won't go into it though. So in principle, at least to evaluate this volume of, of, of this volume of the, of the modulus space of quadratic differentials, what I can do is I can compute these correlators through either the Verisoro constraints or some of these recursive relations or some other framework. And I put it in here to get to compute my n. And then I, you know, I plow through, I compute the p from the n, and then I apply z to it, and then I sum over all, all gammas, and then I get, get a formula for, for q of g. Okay, and you can see some sort of I've just taken a picture here of, of of this being done in the case where G is two, so Q Q of two, Q of two zero, so G is two in in. Um, so I'm, I'm all yeah. uh, a question about this previous theorem. Yeah. Uh, remind me in that theorem, one in that theorem there's somehow the the actual intersection number interpretation is not used. It's somehow you see that by some kind of inspection of the geometry of the surface. Is it uh, or it's. Uh, what do you mean is not used? Well, suppose it somehow does it, it it does it use the fact that this that this uh, polynomials have something to do with intersection numbers. So it uses, uh, or, or so, it's just 
or it just uses the trivalent graph kind of structure? It's based on the trivalent graph construction. Yeah, yeah. So this is yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at least the proof is. I mean, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe one could cook up some some algebra geometric interpretation. I mean, one could cook up an arbitrary an, an, another another proof that uses the the algebra geometric description of these intersection numbers. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. The original proof of this result was based on on the trivalent graph description, which is okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so as I said before, you can in principle compute everything, and here, 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 here's how it looks. Uh, in the case of when Q, Q um, when the genus is two. So now um, the interesting part that I want to describe next is that these individual summands, these Zs of P's, P of T's terms, I mean, these, these terms corresponding to each stable graph, they admit geometric or topological interpretations, and they can be used to analyze statistics of, you know, of, of these random surfaces. So I'll, 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 I'll try to get to that next. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit easier if I go to this notion of, of square tile surfaces. So I will um, a little bit easier to describe. These are discretizations of of of, of these flat surfaces. So um, a square tile surface is defined to be a, a connected surface that's produced from gluing squares in a certain way. So uh, so I take a finite. So how it works is I take a finite collection of, of you know um, squares that each have side length a half, and I glue pairs of vertical to vertical or horizontal to horizontal sides using either translations or reflections. So here's an example. I've taken two squares here. Uh, I glued these sides by the, the vertical sides by translations and then pairs of horizontal sides by reflections. And what I get at the end is something that looks kind of like a pillowcase. It's, it's two squares that are stacked on top of each other with these seams that are like the seams of a pillowcase. Um, okay, so maybe an alternative description for those for the, those who are more, who, are more, who find that the, the differential notation more more natural is that these are quadratic differentials whose periods all lie in one half of z of i, right? And this should be somewhat obvious um, because every period is either you know it's either uh, vertical or horizontal of length one half. So the horizontal of length one half is one half. The horizontal period of uh, the vertical period of length one half is i over two, and so I take all possible um, all possible such periods. So once again, we have simple poles at any vertex whose total angle is pi and, and zeros whose uh, of order m, um, whose vertices have total angle two pi times m plus one. And we'll be restricted to, uh, for the purposes of what we'll describe next, we'll be restricted to um, the principal stratum. So we'll, we'll only think about um, squirrel tail surfaces that have only simple poles or simple zeros. So we don't allow any angles bigger than four pi. And will Sn of one to the m minus one to the m to be the set of all square tile surfaces of area at most two n, so at most two n squares involved in this gluing procedure, with m simple zeros, so um, so m angle, so m vertices whose total angle is four pi, and n simple poles, so n points whose total angle is pi. So if m is um, four g plus n minus four, then any then the surface has genus g. So. So, okay, so this, this, as I said before, the space Sn can be used to discretize the principal stratum. So, I mean, so I'll let, so I'll let S tilde of n to note the set of, basically I, I take S of n and I scale it, I scale it down by, uh, by one over root n. So instead of surfaces S such that uh, root n times S is, is in this S of n thing. So all, so all side lengths of, of these squares. So it's again a square style surface with the same sort of data, except every square now has side length one over two root n instead of one over two. Um, so it's, it's sort, of, sort of transparent now that, I mean, my area originally was at most two n. So after I do the scaling, any surface in this S tilde has, at Marius, has area at most a half. So if, if I let n tend to infinity, then I can sort of view this, 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 uh, the scaled down version of um, of the set of square, square tile surfaces and as a, a discrete approximation for QG of n. So um, what one can actually use this to compute volume. So if I if I let if I look at um, n to the minus d, so if I let d be the dimension of this of this modulus space and look at n to the minus d times the number of square tile surfaces with four g plus n minus four vertices of angle four pi and, and, and uh, vertices of angle pi, then this thing will tend to a limit and the limit will, you know, after maybe a little prefactor be be given by the, the original volume I was computing. I mean, the volume that I had, I had discussed previously. Um, so as I said before, this D is the, can be viewed as dimension of the complex dimension of this moduli space, which is six G plus two N minus six. One can see that this 
SN here, it's, it's size scales like n to the 6g plus 2n minus 6. And this, this prefactor, okay, this is a somewhat technical point, but the prefactor arises from differentiation. I define the volume to be of this moduli space to be the volume when I restrict to quadratic differentials of area exactly equal to one half. Whereas here, I'm looking at square tile surfaces whose area is at most equal to one half. So there's a diff little differentiation involved. But, um, yeah. Um, okay, but this is one way of actually computing these volumes. So now the point is that um, I recall that this volume is equal to a sum of these ZP of gammas, uh, where the gamma ranges over all, over all these uh, uh, stable graphs of genus G. And the ZP of gamma will count square tile surfaces that are associated, gamma, associated with gamma in a certain sense. So this, the stable graph gamma will contain certain geometric information about the surface. And this can be used to analyze um, very statistics about random square tile surfaces. So I will I will try to um, describe that in, in the next few slides. And then we will see, see that these sorts of sums are supported in a few terms. And those few terms will tell me how a typical square tile surface behaves along the lines of Andre's question. Um, okay. So, okay, so let me go ahead and describe what it means to associate a graph with a square tile surface. So um, I'll fix some square tile surface S and then I'll decompose S into a bunch of maximal cylinders. So as you can see here, I've taken a square tile surface and there are four cylinders in which it decomposes. And uh, each cylinder is sort of distinguished by this waist curve here, um, you know, just a curve, a circumference curve, it wraps around the cylinder. Um, okay, so each cylinder, as I said before, it emits a waist curve. See, I'll call the cylinder C1, C2, all the way to CK. So here K is equal to four. And each cylinder CI emits a waste curve gamma I. And um, so, so I have, I've drawn these four waste curves, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, and gamma four. Okay, so pinching, so if I, so if I pinch, so if I, you know, if I just take each gamma I and, and, and reduce it to a point, basically, I get a stable curve, and I get a stable curve with a stable graph. And, and um, maybe, I mean, it's a stable curve in the classical sense, it's an element of, you know, MGN bar, uh, but maybe, it, the the graph is 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 rather is rather concretely defined in terms of the geometry of the original square tile surface. The vertices are the connected components of after I if I sort of cut out these these curves if I if I pinch them and then re remove the points, I'm going to break my surface up to, into a bunch of connected components. So as you can see here, there are five of them. There's the one, there's this one, there's this one, there's this one, there's this one, and this one. All of the spaces between the waist curves. So those are the vertices of my graph. And as you can see here, there are five of these um, vertices. The edges are gonna be the waste curves themselves. So as I said before, there are four of them. And the unpaired half edges are gonna be the poles of the quadratic, quadratic differential. They're gonna be the vertices at which uh, I have an angle of just equal to pi. And those are gonna to belong to some of the connected components. And at those connected components, you see a half edge coming out. For example, here, you have these two uh, vertices here, which, which have an angle which will have an angle of pi after the, the folding. Okay, so, um, so I'll let Sn of, I'll, I'll decorate it by this gamma, to know the set of squirrel tile surfaces in S of n that are associated with gamma in the sense. So after I, you know, I, I take this, this decomposition by maximal cylinders and I, I ask myself, how does it, um, um, I mean, I, I cook up a graph from it and I let SN of gamma denote the set of those square tile surfaces that are associated with this gamma. So, I mean, the basic statement, I mean, the, the statement that really gives rise to um, the, one, the one back here is that uh, after I do the same normalization, it's so a 2D times limit as n times infinity of n to the minus D times the size of this refined set, this gamma refined set is gonna be equal to the Z of P of gamma. Okay, so if I sum over all gamma, then I immediately get, um, I, I should be getting the volume, and th this is this is what we had before. Question. Yeah. So, uh, of course, I uh, it's been a while since I thought about this sort of things, yeah. but my memory from many many years ago that if you do something like this very naively, then you're gonna get not just zeta values, but also get multiple zeta values. That's is correct. There some That's kind of is there some kind of miracle happening here, or that the multiple zeta cancel out, or it's a, or it's somehow obviously there are no. I mean, your definition of Z is had only single zeta values, if I, as I remember. Oh, but wait, when did I define the zeta value? You had this zeta, I mean, that, that oh. linear map, yeah. That yeah, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It has there were no multiple, no multiple zetas here. Is that, is that um, somehow obviously going to happen here, or is there some miracle happens in this computation? 
it's it's not a yeah so it's as i recall it's it's not it's not so much of a miracle it's just that the 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 symmetry i mean it, it, it's an asymptotic symmetry i think i think like the i mean zeta values you you have the you have the you know you take the sums ordered right i mean you have like one over n1 to the s1 n2 to the s2 where this, the sums are ordered right or yeah correct yeah yeah okay so if i recall correctly what happens is that um um one uh there's an asymptotic symmetry which allows you to undo the ordering basically and that that's happening because you're taking the limit as n to n tends to 30. so if i if i understand correctly this this sort of limit should not involve multiple zeta values. I'm, yeah, I, I think I think it doesn't. At least I don't. The procedure that I'm describing here does not involve any sort of miracle, from my from my recollection. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, at least in the sense that there's no miracle that just tells you that a multiple zeta value is equal on the nose to a zeta value. I think what happens is that uh, you have some sort of Zeta value that comes from this counting, but then you can sort of just by by various symmetries. If if I'm willing to sort of neglect lower order low, terms that are lower order in n, I, I I don't I don't see I, the multiple feature of it goes away, and I just get regular zeta values. Um, anyway, yeah, okay, so um, okay, yeah, so I should say that okay, so this is the volume of the full modular space of quadratic differentials. They're actually similar. There's, there's a very beautiful story of, of Mercikani from her. From from our thesis that gives uh, similar expressions for simple closed geodesics on random hyperbolic surfaces with a given multicurve type. So I'll just quickly in words describe this. I, I won't go into it later in this talk, but I'll quickly in words describe what's going on there. So one takes a random hyperbolic surface according to say the Bay Peterson volume, and one considers a random um, a random multicurve on it according to the Thurston measure. So um, then one asks oneself how how does this um, how does this uh, multi-curve look like. Okay, so as it turns out, there's a similar graph you can associate with this multi-curve. There, the vertices of the graph correspond to how many um, a multi-curve is, is a linear combination of, of simple closed curves. So it corresponds to how many distinct simple closed curves are in the linear combination, and the uh, those are the edges. So the edges of the graph correspond to how many simple closed curves are in the are in the are in your multi-curve. So there's something like the um, the cylinders. And the vertices correspond to if I sort of cut the hyperbolic surface along the multicurve, how many connected components do I have after the cutting procedure? And the formulas are almost are super closely related. I, actually, this, it's exactly the ZP of gamma, but there's also some global prefactor. That's the only difference. Um, so once one has as access to asymptotics for these quantities, one can also um, get asymptotics for those quantities as well. Okay, so now we can we can um, we can. I can try to explain a little bit more on what, what's going on here. So, um, so as I said before, we have this volume asymptotic for the, the volume of this quadratic moduli space of quadratic, quadratic differentials. So we have our we have the large genus asymptotics for the correlators. We have formulas for these volume in terms of the in terms of the correlators. Of course, the issue is that I have this sum over stable graphs, and the number of stable graphs is just huge. It grows exponential in the genus. Uh, so that's a technical difficulty, but I mean, one can one could sort of overcome this. And what happens is that what one one will one will, will um, what one will eventually see is that um, you can analyze contributions coming from different classes of stable graphs. So graphs come. So if any graph gamma, if I look at the sum over all stable graphs with at least two vertices, so more strictly more than one vertex, then the volume, the sum of all those volume contributions is going to be is going to be you know little o of this thing, little o of eight thirds to the four g minus four, and if I look at the sum of all the volumes of graphs coming from exactly one vertex, then it's going to be equal to this thing basically with some low order correction. Okay, so um, so what this implies is that with high so I can I can view this as now a probabilistic statement along the lines of what Andre of what Andre was asking. So um, with probability one minus little of one, this gamma only has one vertex. And with probability little of one has at least two vertices as the genus tends to infinity. So maybe maybe more geometrically is that if I take my random square tilt surface um, and I pinch all of these um, cylinder waste curves, then that will leave my, then with high probability that will leave my, um, my, my surface connected. 
So, okay, so I've now told you I can more or less throw out. I mean, so actually the technically involved part is, is, is point one, ruling out the contribution of all vertices with at least, all graphs with at least two vertices since there's so many of them. Um, but okay, I'll throw them out for now because I've, I've, I've claimed to you that they're, that they're subdominant. So that leaves me with just the graphs coming from a, a single vertex. Um, so in, in this situation, um, one, okay, so just to remind you of the setup, one has a random square tile surface with n, uh, two n squares of g just g. So first one lets n tend to infinity and one, then one lets g tend to infinity. So the underlying stable graph will have at most, will have exactly one vertex with, with very high probability. And there are gonna be g plus one such graphs. So what these graphs look like is it's gonna be a single vertex, but then it might have a number of loops. Okay, so it's gonna be a single vertex with e self edges or c e loops where e can range from anywhere between zero and g. Okay, so the, the, the I mean, what one can do would further analyze these, um, these single graph contributions so the contribution coming from the probability say that your graph gamma is equal to this specific graph, this graph um, single graph with E vertices, it will by definition more or less is equal to one over the volume times the contribution of the specific single vertex graph. Okay, and the same is that this is equal to, this is asymptotically uh, growing like six, um, uh, six, six pi, square root of six pi G times Z E uh, of, of three G over two E, Minus one e factorial, right? So, um, and one again, so the z here, z here is defined as a sort of zeta deformed harmonic series. So I take all the sum of all a's, um, I, the sum over all k tuples a, whose sum is m, and I look at the product of the zeta, like zeta of 2a1, 2a2, all the way to 2ak, and I divide by a1, a2, all up to, up to ak. So I have this sort of zeta deformed multiple harmonic, I mean, the zeta deformed harmonic series. And this probability that gamma is, is equal to this gamma G of E is going to be asymptotically equivalent to some prefactor times this guy. In fact, the, the, I mean, the fact that this sum is equal to one is, is something that actually takes a little bit of work to see, but it can, be, it can be shown. I mean, so this is a bona fide probability measure more or less. So, sorry. So using, um, using this statement, um, uh, is, is this, this, this cylinder question, this cylinders, they kind of, you know, they, they, it's like a, also, a, a, you know, like a random partition of a certain number, right? That's right. That's right. And you, number... You're saying it has, you know, so many kind of log, uh, log genus parts, but is it, uh, can... yeah, that's right. So, so, so this, uh, as a, uh, that's right. So, um, okay. So, yeah. So, um, is there also a statement what this partition looks like? Or that was my question. Yeah. 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 Um, let me, so the, the joint law of the, um, Okay, so I look at I look at the set of wait the partition. Sorry, which partition? I'm looking at these are cylinders, right? So right, but cylinders they're partitioned their total area in some way, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So that that, that question has not been done, right? So the the, the, the cylinders indeed they, they partition the area in a certain way, and how that partition looks, I'm, I don't think that has been looked into yet. Although I think there are tools to look into that question. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, well, one there are similar, I mean, there are similar sorts of you have results along these lines that actually also refine by, you know, the, the boundary lengths here, like the, 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 the I mean, the, the, the circumferences of these, of these waste curves and the heights of these cylinders. So that, that, that should be something that's accessible. And although to my understanding, no one has done it yet, but I can tell you actually something, um, something else about these, um, about the, this E, which is somewhat curious, it's not mentioned in the slide here. So, okay, as I, as I, as I mentioned here in this bullet point, um, just directly, that you can use these results to show that, that this E converts to a Poisson Brin variable with parameter to one half times log of 24 G plus gamma, where this gamma is the Euler constant. But maybe more specifically than that, in, in you know, in vague, in vague analogy with Andre's question, is that um, the law of this E is actually very closely related to. Um, in the sense that it's total very in total variation, it's unexpectedly close. It's like one over G, off by that of a um, a random per, a random permutation, and uh, the random permutation is not a uniform random permutation. It's a random it's it's a random permutation sampled according to a certain multi-parameter Ewens measure. So I take, um, um, yeah, of a, of a certain multi-parameter Ewens measure. So that if that might. I don't know offhand what sort of measure on uh, what sort of like sort of measure on partitions would give rise to that to that measure on permutations. But um, 
I mean, but. But yeah, I mean, so I mean, the statement, I mean, sort of the more general statement that, the, that they've proven their work is that this 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 random variable e converges. I mean, it, it's it's basically given by the number of cycles in in an, in a random permutation sampled according to a certain a certain Ewens measure. Um, so that doesn't tell you how 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 the how the area is is partitioned, but it gives you sort of more of an understanding on how this thing kind of relates to random permutations. No, that would be a, that would be a conjecture, right? So as we'll be saying, uh, you have here. Uh, you would like the actual cycles to be to be distributed, not just not just the number. Exactly, of exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly as you say, exactly <laughs> as you say, correct. Although I, I can't think offhand about what the what the um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that, that would indeed be that would that would indeed be the, the, the conjecture that the the, the the you know it splits the cycles the cycles themselves split up according to the Ewens measure. Yeah, yeah. Although I don't think that this has been done. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, right. So okay. So as is, so maybe just a few consequences of the, of this of this statement is that first a typical square tile surface has about log g over two, so log of the square root of g cylinders in a um, in a uh, a maximal cylinder decomposition. And second is that it remains connected after I pinch out all of these all of these cylinders. Um, Okay, so any questions about any of that? Okay, so I I, um, I guess I will just summarize. I'm, I'm a little bit early, but if I go into the proofs, this could, uh, I can go down a, a dangerously, I can go well over time if I accidentally do that. So let me just summarize with what, what we did and what I sort of owe you. Uh, for the next talk. So as I said before, we have, I, I, I stated results for the largeness asymptotics of these intersection numbers. As I mentioned before, it, it, there, I, it, sort of the proof is based on a probabilistic interpretation of these Verisoro constraints. So I owe you, I owe you an explanation of, of what, what, the, what that is for next time. I talked about three applications. Um, the first is to, um, to asymptotics for these area Siegel Beach constant. So this is based on, on formulas that express these Siegel Beach constants in terms of, of volumes. So I didn't tell you anything about where those formulas come from. So maybe I, I, I owe you that to a certain extent. Um, the second is that I talked about asymptotics of these volumes of this, of this moduli space. And those were based on um, formulas for the volumes in terms of correlators. So I will owe you something here, but um, I did a little bit beyond that, I think. So, um, I mean, so the, the way in which these formulas come from is that one one looks at square tiled surfaces. So these are you can view these square tiled surfaces as discretizations. Uh, the space of square tiled surfaces is uh, discretizations of, of the QG of n, and one can write this volume um, as um, a sum over contributions of square tiled surfaces that are associated with the stable graph in a certain way. And so the thing that I owe you then is is um, where the expression for this this sort of contribution to the volume coming from a stable graph comes from and how it can be done through correlators. Uh, but using that, if we sort of assume that we could we could we could um, and assumed you know these previous statements, we could we could use them to prove statistics for how these um, random square tiled surfaces look like. Um, so I guess I guess, so to reiterate what I owe you then is um, the proof of this sort of largeness asymptotic results why these Siegel Beach constants are expressed in terms of the volumes, and where does the formula for the, the gamma contribution to the volume come from? And I will certainly do the first one in the next talk in, in some level of detail. I will maybe sketch a little bit on the third one, and then I'll, if I'm very lucky, I might, I might, I might be able to say a few words on, on the second one. Um, so with that, I, I'll, I'll stop, and, and thanks a lot for your attention. Super questions. Um, well, I have a, a question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's funny that the question I asked you on Friday, I had no idea it was related to what we're doing here. But anyway, um, so if, if you look at these uh, large n limits of of these random square tiled surfaces, yeah. you know, you you give some description for a sort of backbone of the surface, you know, in terms yeah. of the yeah, structure yeah. of these graphs. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a hope to describe the surface in a more complete way? You know, in terms, you know, in, in the context of like Brownian maps, there's these descriptions of building it out of Brownian objects. But well, I mean, the, the, the cylinder composition itself is so. If if I have a bunch of cylinders, and I have their heights and their circumferences, this graph this graph tells me how to glue them together. 
Okay, but but do you have the height and circumferences? As yeah, so the, the, this is related to what Andre was asking. Okay. Um, the, these theorems, these theorems, in and of themselves, do not do not give you statistics on them. But what I'm saying is that there is sort of an analog of this of this uh, of the statement here, this refinement that allows you to refine by at least circumference. I can't recall height. I see. So you'll have some sort of continuum tree, and then you'll build it out of, or. or I guess not tree because of it's not a tree. It's just one vertex, and it has, <laughs> yeah. One vertex. Okay. Yeah. Right, cool. Yeah. As I said, the geometry is very different. As I was saying, the geometry is very different from you know if you take these random Brownian maps and in, in this guy, it's it's a, it's a very different looking object. But yeah. Are there are there natural ways to reweight this? You know, so in you know to reweight it based on the number of you know easing models on it, or you know yeah. the different different types of reweightings, which which actually probe other parts of the structure yeah i don't know i mean one would have to think about what sorts of natural i mean th those those arise from uh, from looking at you know statistical mechanical models on 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 the surface i'd have to think about what is the natural statistical mecha statistical mechanical model one should be thinking about you know that's applied that's the, on, on on the surface i, I don't know offhand All right, cool yeah. more questions is there some geometric way to think about this condition that n is O of root G? I don't know. Uh, yeah, this is, um, I don't know. I mean, it's, so you're talking about this one, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can't think offhand. Um, I have to admit, it arises in sort of an unnatural way. It, it might even be removable. Um, so I, I'm guessing what, what what the truth is that what happens is that if one, again, this is not really part of the theorem statement, but I'm guessing that what 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 actually happens is that something like this theorem should be true as long as n is little of g instead of little little of root g. But then there's a correction that has to be added here. And this correction is actually exactly this correction. It says e to the n prime squared over 12g, where n prime is the number of ones. Hmm. So I, I, I think that the, the, the sort of the real condition where one sees sort of a phenomenon, I mean, so basically what I'm saying here is that you should be, I, I'm, I'm guessing that you should be able to sort of extend this theorem past n is equal to, to O of root g, all the way up to n is equal to little o of g at the cost of multiplying by some exponential term dependent on the number of ones in your d. Um, but then after there, I think that the, the things will become very different. So like I, when n is literally on the same order as g, then then the behavior of these intersection numbers will become uh, rather different from from anything that looks like this. It will start to the, the universality will fail, and all sorts of all, all sorts of sorts of things along those lines will happen. So I think the real the real the real sort of the true condition is sort of n is equal to little of g. Now, if there's sort of a natural description of why something's algebra geometric description of why something weird is happening there, I'd be curious to know, although I can't think offhand. I think it was well, just the dimension, right? Dimensions linear in G, so being- uh, Yeah, 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 that's right. I mean, yeah, I mean, you sort of equal, 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 I mean, equal orders of the dimension are being split between them. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, that's right. More questions? Well, if, uh... If no uh, further question, then we will be looking forward to the uh, to the second part uh, to be <clears throat> at uh, will be presented next week. Thanks, them all so much. Thanks, everybody. We'll see everybody next week.